Welcome back to another episode. You may have noticed that I have changed the name of the podcast from The Functional Health Show to Holistic Health with Arjun. The thing is, last couple of weeks have been eventful in a way in terms of learning. The change has more to do with the knowledge that I have recently been indulging in, which is of course related to health and well-being. It has, in a way, further broadened my horizons in a more fruitful and productive direction. I'll be sharing more about it in the next episode since we have a long but really interesting discussion coming up. Do you know what Jim Carrey and Daniel Ratcliffe have in common? Well, they are both victims of FASD. Today's episode is going to be all about FASD. For many of y'all, this may be the very first time that you may have come across this term. It's called Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. As the name suggests, they are a group of conditions that can occur in a person whose mother consumed alcohol during pregnancy. It's considered the world's number one disability. And the most concerning part is there's almost no awareness or recognition globally about it. And around 87% of the time, it's misdiagnosed. However, there's hope and it begins with awareness. And to bring about a widespread awareness, there's a feature length documentary film in the making called Embraced. So today, we'll be conversing with Joel Shakrin, the director and co-producer of Embraced, along with Cedric Terrell, who is also the co-producer and public health advisor at Embraced. And just to give you a little background on our guest for today, Joel is a passionate filmmaker and the co-founder of the non-profit Hope and Rescue Foundation. And Cedric is a Hollywood actor and Community Health Program Coordinator in Los Angeles, California. And in today's episode, we'll be discussing about the signs and symptoms, how we can uplift and improve lives of people with FASD. Why is this problem so prevalent in our world? How it also impacts our society, ways in which we can resolve these issues, why it's misdiagnosed, how we recognize it, and can catch it early and much more. So stay tuned. You can regain your health no matter what for desire backed by faith knows no such thing as impossible. Hi, this is your host Arjun. I'm a functional medicine health professional and personal trainer and I'm here to motivate and empower you with knowledge that will help you to regenerate your health and align with your higher vision. show and today we'll be talking about FASD. So before before we get started with FASD, I would love to know more about you Cedric and even you Joel. So my question for Joel is what made you so passionate about directing and producing? Especially when I heard about you, you know, being so passionate about this since the eighth grade. That that is really interesting and I would love to know that. Well my passion for film and media and photography actually came from eighth grade. I had a crush on my teacher who taught typing and photography. (laughs) The photography stuck and it's all I've ever really done. Uh, You have the odd jobs here and there, but photography and filmmaking. And so I eventually landed in Minneapolis 30 some years ago to serve the advertising community and the Fortune 100, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 type of clients through ad agencies. And so I've been producing brand ads for years. And somewhere along the line, maybe 20 years ago, I started hauling the video camera out on projects. And I think the first project I did was with a Gatorade. I was hired to do a still project for a Gatorade ad. And the art director was like, yeah, bring your video camera along. We can play around a little bit. We've got a few hours. And so I really fell in love with 
just putting all that together. Uh, they did not hire me to do the directing or the photography for a TV commercial. It was for the print ad, but the art director allowed me to really get my feet wet and I haven't looked back. So how amazing, how amazing. That's so nice to know. And Cedric, tell us a little about your work in the public health sector and, and what got you involved in this documentary that you're going to talk about today. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> my background is kind of a hybrid. I'm actually a veteran of the United States Armed Forces. I'm a Marine. Um, also, um, I have been in Hollywood as an actor for 15, 20 years. I've starred on some of the major TV shows, CSI, Dawson's Creek, ER, California Dreams, Dangerous Minds, and I have a couple of films that should be coming out later this year. Uh, but after years of being in Hollywood and becoming disenchanted with the business, um, I fell into public health. Um, my father had passed away seven years ago um, due to complications from a stroke, and he just did not take care of himself over the years. And watching that, you know, and health being such a big part of my own personal life, you know, health and fitness and whatnot, um, while I was going to the University of Southern California, I decided to pursue uh, public health as as a as an area of, of study. So once I uh, completed my degree at um, USC, I moved to New York and uh, was accepted to Columbia University uh, to do my master's in public health. And it was at that point that I took theory and started working on vulnerable populations and disproportionate communities. And um, fast forward to where we are today, many of the populations that I've worked on, including where I'm working at now, which is one of the largest treatment centers in California, we have an annual revenue now $350 million a year, and I work in the grant writing department, um, we do dual diagnoses at the center. And many of these patients that come through, based on the research that I have um, um, read that Joel had, had given to me, um, have, uh, I know that they have fetal alcohol syndrome, but it's not something that we treat there, you know, and um, I would like to, you know, come up with a solution where that could be much more explored. I, like I was saying earlier in the conversation, I do not understand why this has flown underneath the umbrella for so long. You know, there's a lot of information out there about it, but um, it seems like a documentary could really shine a light on this and really get some more support at the federal level, you know, so we can bring this to yeah. the forefront. There are, there are many um, negative health, uh, uh, associative negative health outcomes that are a re direct result of fetal alcohol syndrome that we're just overlooking, you know, and um, that's one of the reasons why I'm so thankful for working with Joel. Yeah. Incredible, but so amazing that you guys are doing it. But what got you all on this topic? Yeah, I can speak to that. The, the project uh, really started because my son was diagnosed with uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And specifically, that's an umbrella term. And sometimes we use fetal alcohol syndrome. But technically, that is the physical aspects, which are less than 10% of the overall diagnosis. My son was diagnosed uh, with ARND, which is alcohol-related neurological disorder. It is one of the four or five diagnoses that fall under the umbrella of FASD. So FASD is not a specific diagnosis, it's an umbrella diagnosis. Um, and so in that context, I'm educated my wife and I brought our son home from the hospital knowing the birth mother drank alcohol. Um, and we embraced her. It was 14 years later that we connected the dots between his behavior and, and the alcohol f during in utero because it's an invisible disability. It, it's a brain injury. And so really the way to understand it and, and move away from the skepticism is to look at brain the brain scans when you see a brain scan you're going to see a shrunken brain there's less cerebral folds it's uh there's holes in the um dark holes that shouldn't be there there's uh the alcohol affects the the brain physically 
primarily in the limbic system as well as the frontal cortex. So that means impulsivity, self-regulation, and executive functions are the main, main ways in which the alcohol affects the brain. And I'm not anti-alcohol. I'm saying don't drink during pregnancy because of the long-term effects uh, and the issues that land in public health and the chaos in families and schools, et cetera, et cetera. There's, it's preventable. And so if we don't drink, and, and I say that not lightly, I understand there's a whole issue around addictions and supports and, and we need to address those things. But, you know, at the basic level, it's a preventable issue. Exactly. Um, yes. So what are the, some of the symptoms? How would people know about it? Simple things that you might be able to understand is processing speed, executive functions, short-term memory. Do they have sensory issues? Are they struggling with sleep? It, there's 428 comorbidities related to this. And so oftentimes it's diagnosed as a single standalone autism or a learning disorder. But if you're able to go back and look at the history from the trauma and from the alcohol in utero, and then you can start to put some things together that there's a number of issues uh, that add up. You know, you might put um, a question or a request in front of your, your child and say, it's time to do the dishes. And they might be doing something else as a simple example. And you get the teenage pushback, right? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't tell me what to do, et cetera, et cetera. Rather than moving towards that, make the statement in such a way that is more human, if you will. So I'll use my son's name, Sam, in five minutes. Can you help out the family and do the dishes? You still might get the processing speed chatter because he's doing something else. Don't tell me what to do. Nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't engage. Walk away. And in five minutes later, he's up doing the dishes. That's that's a effective intervention, but you may find those kinds of behaviors as a entry point or an understanding that you might be dealing with something bigger than just teenage pushback or rebellion, if that makes sense. 50 years of research that's really told us that alcohol affects the, the development of the brain uh, from infant, from conception all the way through the time that you're breastfeeding. That alcohol can affect the brain and its development. Those are the really critical years, but not everyone's affected in a way that you might. So think of it in terms of wind in a storm. It's a fact that wind blows trees down and branches down, but it doesn't blow them all down, right? And so, however, alcohol's impact on individuals is a spectrum. And so you might see something like, I'll be public and say, we should explore, was Steve Jobs affected? We know that his birth mother drank alcohol and we know he had really bad behaviors. It doesn't, didn't affect his ability in brilliance or intelligence, but we're not connecting the dots that that could very easily have been the root cause behind his, his, and then how do you deal with those? And you don't want to slow potential down. You'd rather want to enhance it coming alongside them and understanding there's processing speed, understanding some of those better interventions from age 14 with my son till now has reduced the chaos by exponentially in our home uh, and it's given him a different trajectory in life. Okay, so it's all about the spectrum and the effect is always more or less, it differs in each individual. Correct. And so a, another framework, just kind of spending some time at this is what's the length and the width and the depth and the height of this issue, right? And so the way that I look at it is, is the length of the issue is how much alcohol was drank during pregnancy, right? And then the effects that the alcohol has on a person 
we could consider that. So somebody might be affected and they become aggressive or they become, uh, they retreat, right? So alcohol has different effects on a person. So I look at that as the whip. And then the height of the issue is really there's 400 and co 428 known comorbidities with that. So it's, it's a really misunderstood diagnosis uh, in a lot of ways. And then the, the depth of the issue is really more our lack of understanding that drives the secondary and the traditionary issues. So before I understood this, it would be easy to diagnose my son as oppositional defiant. But when I've changed that and give him time to process and work with him in ways that are his brain differences, right? It has changed things. And so the secondary issues are really uh, like oppositional defiance and traditionary might be more criminal justice involvement or even suicide uh, to take it out to an extreme. Oh my. And, uh... And basically, what age can one see uh, signs of FASD? Had we been educated or knowledgeable and not naive about the issue, we could have very easily spotted it at age two, oh. just developmentally. He was not sleeping. He would crawl out of his crib and not sleep. He would disrupt us all night long. Oh, my. So that would be one thing. Yeah. How have you been handling it apart from, of course, being lenient in a way and of course, understanding and proceeding carefully? What else have you been doing or the measures that can be taken and, and we know that child is suffering from FASD? I think it's as simple as making sure you're working at the relationship and not at the behavior. I spend time with him. I shut down and I go fishing with him. He likes to fish and building that relationship. So there's the trust and the relationship. And that's, that's good for all human existence is to have relationships that you can build and trust on, right? It's pretty, it's pretty simple in those regards, but understanding that he might be processing something in a given way. My wife and I just constantly have to uh, embrace each other and remind each other there's processing speed. There's a sensory issue going on. There's a friendship issue going on. Our kids really struggle um, with the social adaptability. And so any friend's a really good friend. They may not even know their name, but geez, spending time and they end up in the wrong group of friends because they're seeking friendships. And so by intervening and being in a relationship with him, I'm able to speak to those kinds of things and help direct him. The other piece is we have a, uh, for our son, an enormously strong support system. He has a social worker that loves him. When he had to go back to Cameroon for family issues, he's on Zoom outside of his pay period calling Sam on Zoom and wanting to spend time with him, right? He's got a therapist who uh, understands this issue and the, the support systems go on and on. His, our family and extended family supports him well. And so that changes the trajectory and that takes effort, it takes time. Joe, how did you, I, I mean, I've been meaning to ask you this forever. Um, how did you come up with the name Embrace? Because you mentioned it several times while you were talking. I just went, wait a minute. You embraced your son. How did that, I didn't mean to take your job. I'm just, uh, Arjun. Oh, no, that's, that's, this is a discussion. Please, please feel free. <laughs> I just had to ask Joel. I didn't, I wanted to know. How did you come up with that? Yeah, so the name embraced really was a process when we ever, when we're a filmmaker and we're working through an idea or a process of what we're going to produce, etc. Oftentimes there's a list that's that we write up. What what are the names? And oftentimes the names land negatively. And I'm interested in a positive name. I, I love my son. Uh, forget the diagnosis, right? He's my son. 
he's a gift. And so at one point after, I don't know if it was a month, if it was three months of just deliberating over a name of this project, the word embrace came and I grabbed hold of that because I really want a positive name for people to hold on to, for the film to go forward and to build momentum, for sponsors to come alongside it. So that's the process of coming up with the name Embrace. I personally like it because it is positive and it's a name that we can all grab hold of. Sure, it's, it's a wonderful name that you have picked up, really. I should appreciate that. And, and so, well, uh, the question, it's its great, a great question by you, Cedric. <laughs> so, Cedric, tell me about, uh, in your line of work in the public health sector, have you ever come across these cases? Because, of course, as, as you all mentioned that, you know, this is one of the no world's number one developmental disability, and it kind of is, of course, undiagnosed. So, have you ever come across such situations or individuals yeah like, so I, what I, like i was sharing before um joe has done an exhaustive amount of research on this project and um he has a deck an actual deck for the project for the film so i took the deck and i brought it to some of my colleagues over at work and we looked it over and it was it dawned on us that we have patients that come through our treatment center that have these type of symptoms that he spoke about now, and that's also in his deck. But there's nothing we can do about it at this point. We, we, we're we not equipped to treat fetal alcohol syndrome at the center. You know, we're just looking at, you know, people who are using heroin, cocaine, um, obviously alcohol, um, and they have mental health issues because we're a dual diagnosis uh, treatment center. No one stopped to think about fetal alcohol syndrome. And, you know, it, it would be a long process for us to come up with a solution to be able to go ahead and move forward and treat. So this was something I was discussing with Joel, what would be the best way to roll that out? You know, um, because they're there, you know, and we're aware of that they're there. Um, but as far as taking the next step, I, you know, I, it, my hands are tied, you know, and it's painful to, to sit there and watch patients come through who have, you know, been using alcohol since they were eight, nine years old. I have their file, their medical file. And you wonder where did that first come from? You know, and based on the research that I've read from Joel and, you know, listening to this podcast, I know where it came from, you know, but I have to, I have to draw a correlation between that and then, you know, figuring out the best way to roll that out, you know, at the center. And, some people are, um, you know, particularly a lot of the executives are just kind of, they don't want to touch that, you know, and I'm a New Yorker, you know, and it's like, we want to get our hands into everything. And um, they're just, uh, there's resistance there. And of course, I think the biggest challenge in FAST is that it's it's not easily diagnosable. Yeah. It, it's not so much that it's hard to diagnose, it's that there's a number of things that Citrix up against. One is it's not recognized in the United States in the world of education. So in the world of education, federally, we recognize uh, various uh, disabilities and we give accommodations to those. It's not on the list. Uh, there's a list of 12 plus the 13th is other, so it falls under other. And yet it's two and a half, three, 300% more prevalent than autism. And it's on the list, right? But, uh, and part of that is the misunderstanding that has taken place over and over again. It's close to 90% of the time. I think it's 86.5% of the time, technically. Uh, that Dr. Ira Chesnoff out of Chicago, who works in this area, did the research and a study, and he discovered that those numbers, that 86 point or 87.5, 86, forget the exact, anyway, I'm just going to round it out. Basically, 90% of the time, our kids are misdiagnosed with a standalone diagnosis of a learning disorder or uh, those kinds of things. A autism is oftentimes the case. 
because of the, the social aspects. And so it's not on the DSM-5, which is a, another layer for to be able to give professional services. And so I can see where the executives, uh, the leadership at your health, it's not on the DSM-5. Why should we touch it? Because you're going to be an uphill battle to get paid for it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. So basically, it's not about uh, being missed out. It's more about a misdiagnosis. It's not basically hard. It's just get labeled yeah. as something else. Right. Yeah. It's 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 not so much hard if you have a clinic, but yeah, not all clinics. Very few clinics, actually, worldwide, not just in the U.S., worldwide, don't have uh, the ability to diagnose because they don't understand it. But to actually understand it, there's some very strong tools to do that assessment. Uh, but people just aren't trained in that area. So basically, your documentary is going to bring, bring about the right awareness, the very much needed awareness, so that certain protocols can be created and more clinics can start, you know, working on those lines. Yeah. Our goal is really to start a conversation, right? It's, I'm yeah. a filmmaker and, and the secondary level is then let's take that information and then be like in Citrix camp and start to push this forward. Here's the research and, and to approach the federal government so that it can become part of the DSM-5. Um, and, and kids mm -hmm. can get the supports they need and the training they need. And so there's some federal legislation in the U.S. going on right now called the FASD Respect Act that'll help move that needle forward as well. Amazing. Okay, so how does it work out in our society? Like, what are the dangers of basically this problem? Well, for my wife and I, we were quite naive when we adopted. It wouldn't have changed the trajectory of our adoption, but it would have prepared us better uh, so that we could have learned more and how to help our son at a younger age. Uh, but the reality is the foster care, the adoption centers uh, are dealing with this every day. Uh, people aren't able to maintain a family and they give them up for adoption for various reasons. And oftentimes those are related to addictions. And uh, we don't necessarily correlate that that's going to be a problem in our home. That's That was us, right? That we're hearing the same extensive numbers within foster care and adoption. The U.S. is number one in the world for adoption. Spain is number two. And we're adopting from the Ukraine, and it's a high prevalence there, Ukraine and Russia for alcohol consumption, and that whole Eastern Bloc, I should say. The One of the statistics that we don't really recognize is that Korea is the world's number one alcohol con consumption per capita, and it's one of the go-to countries for adoption. Um, and so from that perspective, we need to be better prepared for how to manage and help our children, right? You have this big dream of having a healthy family. And we've been blessed to understand this issue. I would have never had it on our radar, but it's come through adoption. It would have been nice to have been better prepared. And now at age 14, I've committed, I've put all of my film projects aside to really to focus on this issue. It's such a prevalent issue. Uh, in the U.S., it's one in, from a diagnostic standpoint, it's one in 20 children in our schools by a study done in 2018. And it was 6,600 children in four cross sections of our society. And of those 6,600 kids, only two were actually had a diagnosis ahead of time. But yet it was one in 20 of our children. So it's prevalent in our society in that way. So we need to be better prepared for how to help kids with education. And mnemonic teaching raises the bar for a child's ability to understand and uh, retain 
memory and to learn and to grow. That's true for our children that are brain, that have been rewired by alcohol, as well as a child that isn't. And uh, we need to be applying that mnemonic teaching in a better way, uh, more effective ways in our classroom. But also, we've had quite a spree of school shootings, mass killings, and by a study done um, by Jody Allen Crow in a book called The Fatal Link, he's determined through some pretty heavy duty research that it's 80% of our children uh, that are doing the shooting have been affected by alcohol. And it becomes the traditionary, secondary and traditionary kinds of things. So they, the grandparents raising the child and having no clue how to manage that parent, how to give that care to the child. And so they just keep pushing him further and further. The teacher doesn't understand that they have a condition uh, as such, and they push them further and further. And we end up with some pretty significant issues that need to be addressed. Uh, the Jody wrote the book because he was a teacher that was introduced to this issue and he changed the way he taught in a um, Native American school setting where the prevalence may be a little bit higher. And let me come back to that in the context. There is no race, country, culture, uh, ethnicity that's exempt from this issue. But nonetheless, where there's poverty, sometimes the prevalence is higher. And as a school teacher, he learned and he, and he was able to implement in, in his classroom and that classroom had much, much better results. He became a principal, so then he was able to implement what he learned school-wide, and they had better results. He eventually became a superintendent, and he was able to influence the school systems, and they had better results. And he moved from one school to another, and the year after he left, there was a school shooting, and the principal died. And he was thinking, oh my goodness, that could have been me. What created that problem and he started doing the research which landed on the book that he published called the fatal link and it's the fatal link and his studies about that goes beyond the five percent prevalence uh he advocates through um some of his tools that he came up with not in the book but afterwards the prevalence might be as high as 30 percent in our culture and we're not paying attention from a diagnosis standpoint we know that at least five percent or up to five percent of our u.s and canadian population has been affected so we need to address this from a public health standpoint it's going on in our uh, our culture in so so many different ways and it's not just the u.s it's you know the prevalence is as high as 25 percent in south africa is what some of the epidemiology studies have had. It's 10% in Ireland. It's 10% or better in the Eastern Bloc countries. Um, I just recently heard that it's 36% pockets in Australia. I don't have the data to back that up. I do have the epidemiology research for the others. So it is a major, major issue that we need some awareness and some attention to start understanding, recognizing, and how do we provide the interventions like Jody Crow in an educational setting that changes the, tra the trajectory of our children um, to have better outcomes so that we're not paying for it in criminal justice tax dollars. I, I You know, in terms of intervention, I, I agree with Joel I, I, that uh, early detection, particularly in schools, uh, would be very beneficial. But I'm wanting to shift gears and talk about prevention. And Joel, my question is, is that because um, I, I read a lot of Joel's research, you know, so this gives me a good opportunity to, to ask questions about certain things. Um, what about prevention? Like, what could we do to keep mothers from drinking while they're pregnant? I mean, what is there anything we can to just, you know, prevent it from happening altogether? Well, I think there's three very distinct categories or three main ones. One is you're not aware. Right. The, yeah. If you become aware, 
you may stop, right? And then there's another category that, um, so there's that, just plain awareness at that level will help. Um, the second layer would be, there's some supports that are needed mm -hmm. and people are capable once they understand. Uh, somebody, somebody may be drinking and not be aware of it. And, you know, our, our son, it was five and a half, six months before the birth mother knew she was even pregnant. By that time she had binge drink more than once. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. And so, but the third level would really be, so if people understand it ahead of time, they won't drink. And then there's another group that they would put it aside if they were aware, but they may not even be aware that they're pregnant, right? And then the third level would be, how do we help the generational trauma? And when you've got boyfriends showing up with a six pack to help to celebrate their girlfriend's <laughs> sobriety, you got a problem there. We need to figure out how to come alongside and support the addiction side, the, the generational trauma, because that part of it is really difficult. Yeah, especially if the mother is addicted to alcohol or drugs uh, prior to becoming pregnant. I mean, there's a, there was a study done in, South, uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, where crack addicted mothers were giving birth. And right after they gave birth, they woke up and they had handcuffs. They were handcuffed to the bed. And DIFIS, the Department of Children and Family Services, were taking the kids into the system. The mothers were going to jail. Uh, most of the mothers are African-American mothers. But consequently, that's what happened. You know, and um, how they were aware that these mothers were uh, crack, crack addicted before they had children, I have no idea. I don't have the, the, data, on, the data on that. But it's, it's, you know, how do you expect somebody, because I see them every day. Uh, who has a history of alcohol and drug abuse, albeit addiction, and um, is now pregnant to just stop using for nine months, that's not going to happen, which probably explains the reason why I've been right. seeing so many patients that have the associative effects of fetal alcohol syndrome. No, I, you're, that's, that's the harder category. The, the first two in that group of just not drinking if they're aware of it and then stopping their drinking once they're aware of it. Those two are the easier ones to help. It's the really hard work that we need to do as a society to support the issue. And I advocate it's not necessarily a woman's issue. It's, it's a, as much of a woman's issue as it is, it's a family issue, uh, is what we need to say. And we need to support our families. And we need to put aside the stig stigma and shame. There's a reason that somebody's addicted and they don't wake up in the morning and say, I want to be, you know, an idiot. I want to end up in jail. I want to ruin my life. They want supports, right? We need to give them supports. They're not waking up and saying, and our kids aren't waking up and saying that have been affected. They're not waking up and saying, I want to be an idiot. I don't want to have friends. I don't want to succeed. We need to figure out how to support them because we know our kids are brilliant. Uh, many of them are brilliant and have lots to contribute. We just need to find ways to help them with their brain differences. Well, Joe brings, brings up a really good point in that um, alcoholism is a family disease. That is that is how we that is how we characterize it. It's a family disease. That's why we have Al-Anon, you know, and stigma. You know, who wants to come forward and readily admit that I've been drinking during my pregnancy? You know, and so the stigma from that um, is one of the reasons why mothers and fathers may not come forward. You know, having been a father myself for 15 years, I know that that stings to have to be able to do that. Um, so definitely some support groups would be beneficial, you know, where their anonymity is protected, you know, and um, without legal consequences. That's another reason why people would not want to come forward. Who's responsible for that? Who's going to answer for that? Those, 
are excellent points and they need to be put into the documentary. I don't know that we can solve that problem, but we most certainly can use the story uh, in the documentary to kickstart those conversations so that we can start to address that. It's easy to judge. It's a lot harder to come alongside and to support. The main intent of the documentary, by the way, speaking of intent, so what's the message that you want to convey to Embrace? The message we're trying to get across is don't drink during pregnancy, right? Um, and here's the science behind it. And we want to do that through a story. And so I'm looking at a hybrid to park. So I've done, you know, I don't know, over a hundred interviews or a hundred hours of interviews. And the reoccurring theme is the school issue and, and how it affects the family, how it affects criminal justice. And so I've composited a, a character that I want to make as an 11th grade, um, individual and build a story around that individual that helps us move away from the stigma because it becomes a story based on true events and have that professionally done at Citrix sort of Hollywood level that we have it acted out. And now we've got a group of caregivers and researchers and professionals that have been studying along with graphics to really help us understand the processing speed, the, the stacking of issues that have taken place in this individual's life during the course of a day and where did it go wrong? And then come back at some point with the hope because there's plenty of hope and there's a lot of, there's a lot of need for us to anchor on the hope uh, by changing the way that we intervene and understand we will have better results. And so that's where the film really needs to, to land. And the intent of that is also to slice the documentary into some educational segments that can be parked in the educational sector and the criminal justice sector and how we do social work and family uh, inputs, etc., is to slice the documentary so that the grassroots uh, advocates like myself can go to the PTA, the teacher parent associations, and show it for 15 minutes or 20 minutes and we have a Q&A. And how do we begin those conversations? And so there's layers to the project. I want to have a creative way to get there and then a creative way on the back end, if you will, for how we're going to change and transform the systemic issue. Oh, wonderful. And so where will the documentary be available and when, when is it releasing? Our goal is to release it September of next year. Okay. So we're on a fast track fast track to get some funding and start producing. That's the goal. But given given it's a film and we've got to raise dollars, those dates may change around. Um, the distribution can come in a lot of different ways. Uh, we may be online and do online watch parties driven by sponsorship, uh, marketing. We may end up in the theater there's a pretty strong core team that has experience and connections. I have an agent that has marketed my film. It's, it's easy to go those routes, but I think we might find a greater audience by going on online. Um, once the project is nearing completion, we'll have those conversations and discussions. What's the best way uh, because to land in a theater, it's I don't have $125 million like Marvel does to run billboards and TV commercials. <laughs> so we may be better suited to, to start with uh, the online audience and the passion that, you know, you, uh, an attorney in the world of film will talk about start with throwing the the stone in the pond and the first ripple is really who are your impassioned audience 
which would be the FASD community. And they are absolutely impassioned. They are advocates beyond advocates. And then it grows to the like-minded audiences of mental health and family concerns and foster care and uh, the list goes on and on that you can grow that ripple from a smaller audience and that may be best suited in an online format that we can have and host watch parties. Oh, okay. Appreciate, appreciate you, Joel. Um, I, I thought that was the great, a great metaphor about the rock in the lake and that one little ripple, you know, um, you know, embraced is a movement and movements are very powerful. And I think the testament of any movement is what the movement leaves behind, you know, and once it starts to build momentum and other voices get involved, I'm actually glad that the Marvel universe isn't a part of it. So they won't, you know, bastardize something that is so sensitive to people. And um, a movement is really going to kind of, you know, bring together people who may not have access to resources, you know, and, and funding that, that would otherwise be a part of a project like this. That was great, Cedric. Perfect. So uh, is there anything else would, that you'd like to share with our listeners? Any message, anything? Yeah, let's leave with, we know we need to address the stigma and the skepticism because this issue isn't seen like another physical disability might be seen. It's cognitive and we need to move away from skepticism and really start to understand there's some serious cognitive issues and there are ways in which to help that bring hope. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. So, I mean, it's, it's really appreciable once again, what you all are doing and to create awareness. I think more than anything, it is a family issue and more than anything, we also need to focus on the prevention and your documentary Embraced is surely going to help us address this main part where, you know, we really need to educate the masses about the problem and, and, make, the, and make the families and make people realize that there's no safe amount of alcohol which can be consumed even from the time of conception. Am I right? You are right. It doesn't matter the type of alcohol, if it's beer, wine, or spirits, alcohol is alcohol. And so <clears throat> you hit that right. Wonderful. And if our listeners would like to contribute to what you're doing, is there a way to do that? Yes, very easily. Embracedmovement.org. And there's an easy way to donate at that point. Great. Uh, at some point, we may do some crowdsource funding, but embracedmovement.org. And we're also on social. We've just started the process on Instagram and Facebook to start. And that is Embraced FASD for both Instagram and Facebook. Perfect. So I'll be placing all the links uh, in the show notes so our listeners can find it. Perfect. It was so nice to have both of you all on the show. And I thank you all for being there and also educating our listeners. We really look forward to your documentary. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us. And uh, we're honored that we're kicking your podcast off the ground. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you, Joel. If you'd like to keep in touch, subscribe to the newsletter. For more personalized support, you can start by scheduling a free call with me. If you find what I do helpful, you can support the show by becoming a patron. All links can be found below in the show notes. Until next time, stay healthy, stay happy.